Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we are talking about a leaked email from Elon as we approach quarter end, a new firmware update from Tesla, a meeting in Travis County on Tesla's potential gigafactory in that location, some renewable energy news in Australia, and a partnership between Mercedes and Nvidia. We'll start off with the leaked email from Elon, which seems to have become a quarter end routine. In this case, Electrek is reporting on the email, which was apparently sent yesterday afternoon, Monday afternoon, to all Tesla employees, saying, quote, for many reasons, a great deal of Tesla execution worldwide is packed into the final week of the quarter. It is very important that we go all out through the end of June 30 to ensure a good outcome. Wouldn't bring this up if not very important. Thanks, Elon. End quote. So I think the first thing that comes to mind for more bullish observers is, okay, Elon may be referring to the potential for profitability here. If Tesla goes all out, maybe they can achieve that for Q2. Obviously, that would preclude S&P 500 inclusion, so maybe that is why Elon is saying that this is so important. I don't fully agree with that line of thought. I do think it's possible, but personally, I don't think Elon really cares all that much about S&P 500 inclusion. He knows it's inevitable. If Tesla doesn't meet those requirements after Q2, it's almost certainly going to happen after Q3. And we've already seen Elon a couple of weeks back say that the stock price was too high, so it doesn't look like he cares too much about the stock price right now and the short-term support that the S&P 500 inclusion might provide to that price. That being said, separately from S&P 500 inclusion, I do think that Elon would love to show a profit in this situation, knowing that they had their main factory shut down for half the quarter, and amidst a global pandemic, it would be pretty incredible for Tesla to show a profit. That badge of merit, for lack of a better term, I think would be much more motivating to Elon than the inevitable inclusion in the S&P 500. Regardless of the underlying motivation, though, it does seem that the consensus is that Elon is referring to getting to profitability for Q2, I'm having trouble coming up with other non-generic things that it could be referring to, so I think I lean towards that consensus meaning as well. I do want to point out though that just because there is a leaked email from Elon here, it doesn't necessarily mean the quarter is going to be a good quarter or anything like that. It kind of reminds me of back in Q1 of 2019, which of course was a pretty rough quarter for Tesla. There was a pretty similar Elon email that was leaked that said, quote, For the last 10 days of the quarter, please consider your primary priority to be helping with vehicle deliveries. This applies to everyone. As challenges go, this is a good one to have as we've built the cars and people have bought the cars, so we just need to get the cars to their new owners." End quote. Like this quarter, Q1 of 2019 had its own unique challenges. Tesla was shipping the Model 3 internationally for the first time. That had lowered expectations, but even with those lowered expectations, Tesla missed pretty significantly. They delivered 28,000 fewer vehicles in Q1 of 2019 than they did in Q4 of 2018. A big part of that was those logistical challenges with the international rollout. Those delivery challenges were hinted at by Elon in this email, but the numbers still kind of blindsided everybody. And even though in that email, Elon said that deliveries were the challenge and that Tesla had built the cars and that people had bought the cars, that wasn't exactly the case in hindsight because Tesla's production in Q1 of 2019 was actually down about 9,500 vehicles from what they produced in Q4 of 2018. That was the most significant quarter over quarter decline in vehicle production in Tesla's history by a very wide margin. Prior to that, the largest decline in production quarter over quarter had been about 1,600 vehicles only back in Q3 of 2014. My point here isn't to harp on Tesla for Q1 2019. It's really just to bring up another case where Elon was talking about execution being needed for the last little bit of the quarter. In that case, he was saying deliveries. Here, he's just saying more general execution. But obviously at the end of the quarter, the most important thing is executing on deliveries because any vehicles produced are unlikely to be delivered before the end of the quarter at that point in time. That doesn't mean this email is a bad sign, but it's at least worth considering those things before assuming that this is bullish. Next up today, I want to talk about a software update that is in the initial stages of rolling out. This is 2020.24.6 and Teslify.com currently has this at about half a percent of the fleet, so most people will not have gotten it yet, but this does have the green light continuation feature that we talked about at the end of last week for the early access program. It looks like it has rolled through that early access program pretty quickly, but as a reminder, this is in combination with the traffic light and stop sign control for navigate on autopilot, which if there is a lead vehicle ahead of the Tesla, it will no longer require driver confirmation to go through a green light. Previously, it would have stopped without that confirmation. So nice to see that move so quickly. We do have some other interesting changes with this update as well. Teslascope.com shared the full release notes. And apparently with this version, traffic and stop sign control will be available for Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. The charge rate capacity for some versions of the Model S and Model X will be increased to 225 kilowatts, though I don't know exactly which variants of the S and X that applies to. 
Next is a really nice update on the backup camera functionality. Tesla has added the ability to show the side repeater cameras in addition to the rear view camera. So really nice to have that extra scope of vision and to get those to come up, you just swipe on the display. The last one here, and it's pretty interesting, Tesla has enabled at least some small functionality from the cabin cameras on the Model 3 and the Model Y. In the release notes, Tesla says, quote, help Tesla continue to develop safer vehicles by sharing camera data from your vehicle. This update will allow you to enable the built-in cabin camera above the rear view mirror. If enabled, Tesla will automatically capture images and a short video clip just prior to a collision or safety event to help engineers develop safety features and enhancements in the future. As usual, you can adjust your data sharing preferences by tapping controls, safety and security, data sharing, allow cabin camera analytics. Note, cabin camera images and video clips will not be associated with your vehicle identification number to protect your privacy." End quote. So we know the primary purpose of this camera is to allow monitoring for a future Tesla network robo-taxi scenario, but Tesla now wants to leverage it to help improve safety as well. I would assume that this would probably relate to driver monitoring prior to accidents, which would allow Tesla to have a better understanding of what really is causing accidents and perhaps allow them to improve on their driver monitoring system in combination with autopilot and full self-driving, which as we know right now is just applying a small force to the steering wheel. I would assume granting access to this means that the interior camera would then be always recording during driving and just constantly overriding itself because Tesla says that they would pull the video clips prior to collision. So unless it's anticipating a collision and then flipping on the recording, then it would just have to be on all the time to capture those events. Pretty interesting though, I'd love to hear comments on that and whether or not you will personally be turning on that feature in your vehicle. Next up today is a minor update on the progress of the Texas Gigafactory proposal. There was a hearing today in Travis County for Tesla and local officials to discuss the sought after tax breaks and also to give the opportunity to the public to provide feedback on the proposal. Pretty long discussion, I think it was three or four hours. I caught about half of it. Probably the most interesting part to me was hearing from Tesla's senior global director of public policy and business development, Rohan Patel. He gave a little bit of background on why Tesla is seeking these property tax reductions in Texas. Texas has relatively high property taxes and equipment falls under those taxes. So Tesla has obviously a lot of extremely expensive equipment building a factory, which then accrues property tax. Not looking to start a tax debate, just sharing that background from Tesla. He also pointed out that nearly every state and governor east of the Rockies has pitched Tesla to try to get Tesla to build this in their state. But despite what Patel positioned as being better incentives in other states, saying, quote, much more significant, in many cases eliminating property and equipment taxes completely for 20 years, end quote, that Tesla liked this for three main reasons. Number one, the factory is going to need a diverse workforce. Tesla is a majority minority company and that they look for diversity in both people and type of production workers and engineers needed. They believe Austin fulfills that need for them. They also said, secondly, that the area that they're considering there in Travis County is a location that sits right along the Colorado River and Rohan Patel said that there's lots of opportunity for recreation and beauty in that location with Tesla replacing the old standing gravel mining currently occupying that location. His third point was that they have had lots of meetings with the Dell Valley School District and they strongly believe partnership with Tesla and that school district would be beneficial to both Tesla and the students in the area. So that's kind of how Tesla pitched it here. And then for the public feedback, of course, a mix of positive and negative with varying degrees of enthusiasm on each side. Apparently the next step from here is another hearing that will happen sometime next week. Then there will be further deliberation. Next up today, I wanted to talk about some renewable energy news coming from Australia, specifically in New South Wales. The government there is working on piloting and developing what they are calling renewable energy zones, which they expect to act similarly to power plants, but obviously would be dedicated to renewables. So they're in the early stages of this process. They're examining feasibility and planning for their first pilot renewable energy zone, which is going to be built in the central west area of New South Wales. And as part of this process, they are soliciting project proposals saying, quote, the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment is asking renewable energy, energy storage and emerging energy project proponents to register their interest in being part of the state's first pilot renewable energy zone in Central West NSW, end quote. They say that these registrations of interest will help them understand the scale, location, and types of projects that may be possible for these renewable energy zones. And they say, quote, it is expected that a pilot renewable energy zone in the Central West region would unlock up to 3,000 megawatts 
of new generation by the mid 2020s and be worth around 4.4 billion in private sector investment once fully developed. This is enough new energy generation capacity to power around 1.3 million homes." End quote. So for this initial zone, they're looking for 3,000 megawatts or 3 gigawatts of power capacity, and they're soliciting projects to be involved in that development. The news here is that the registration of interest phase has recently been completed, and quote, Deputy Premier John Barilaro said that the NSW government had received 113 registrations of interest, totaling 27 gigawatts and valued at $38 billion, looking to connect to the 3 gigawatt renewable energy zone in the Central West and Arana regions of New South Wales, end quote. So basically, just a ton of interest in being involved in these projects, and while they're obviously not going to go ahead with 27 gigawatts right away, that's the kind of scale that these companies feel that they can collectively deliver to. So anyway, I was reading about it a bit today. It'll probably involve Tesla at some point, I would have to guess, but it'll be fun to watch those renewable energy zones develop. Lastly today, we heard recently about BMW and Mercedes sort of separating from their partnership to pursue autonomous driving. Today, we have an update from Mercedes that they have now partnered with NVIDIA on that task. In their press release, they say Mercedes-Benz, one of the largest manufacturers of premium passenger cars, and NVIDIA, the global leader in accelerated computing, plan to enter into a cooperation to create a revolutionary in-vehicle computing system and AI computing infrastructure. Starting in 2024, this will be rolled out across the fleet of next-generation Mercedes-Benz vehicles, enabling them with upgradable automated driving functions." End quote. So obviously the first big thing that sticks out there is 2024. That's quite a ways out from now. That's one of the problems with legacy automakers is the length of time that it takes to get a new product to market or a new generation of technology to market. Tesla and Elon have talked about that in the past, trying to shorten that window down as much as possible for Tesla. And thinking about the manufacturing process and setting it up in a way that can be iterative so that you can make improvements on the fly. The press release also said, quote, NVIDIA and Mercedes-Benz will jointly develop the AI and automated vehicle applications that include SAE level two and three levels, as well as automated parking functions, parentheses up to level four, and parentheses, end quote. So the difference between those levels three and four, level three is basically the system can handle pretty much everything, but you have to still be attentive to the system in case it needs you to take over. Level four is when no monitoring is required, no expectation that the human is ready to intervene, but only in specific circumstances, which in this press release, it looks like Mercedes and Nvidia are saying would only apply to parking functions. So for their sake, hopefully they're under promising with the plan to over deliver someday, but those aspirations are relatively low compared to obviously what Tesla aspires to be doing in 2024. Even if they are under promising and over delivering though, they would still need to be splitting the revenues and profits between the two companies. Whereas Tesla of course is positioning themselves to more fully capture the value of such features. That is it for today though. As always, thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and sign up for notifications. Make sure you're following me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and I'll see you tomorrow for the Wednesday, June 24th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.